Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center live for April 22nd, 2021. I'm Joe Lynch. This is the state delegation update with state representative from the 34th, 34th, I got it right, 34th Middlesex District, state rep, Christine Barber. Christine Barber, how are you today? I'm doing pretty well, Joe. Thank you for having me. Terrific, terrific. It's been a, a few weeks. Uh, Senator Jalen was in, Representative Idahoven was in, and you are up. So we're going to start off. Um, Christine, if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask you uh, your reaction. Something that was on everyone's mind uh, that I know of this week was the verdict in the George Floyd um, murder trial. Your reaction to it? Yeah, so I think like many, um, I am... Um, glad that there has been at least accountability in the George Floyd case, um, but also that there's so much loss here and so much for his family, for um, you know millions of people who have been um, traumatized and mourn um, the loss of, of a man in, in the prime of his life, um, that it doesn't bring justice. And I think we've seen that throughout the week. There's been a number of uh, shootings of um, black youth this week and um, there's so much more to do. So um, on one hand, glad for the accountability, but also acknowledging that there's much more to do and I hope to be you know, with folks in the fight as we continue to work on, on police brutality, white supremacy and all that we have to continue to address. Thank you very much. Um, let's move into some of the bills that you have been working on um, all session uh, and I no doubt some of those bills you're going to be continuing to work on. Um, I just pulled a few of them off of the docket there. You've uh, been spending an extraordinary amount of time on uh, children, families, disabilities. Um, I know you you folks at the state house have the budget hearings coming up. Um, early childhood, a lot of the things that you've worked on consistently. Why don't you take it from there and talk about some of the priorities you've got in the next few weeks, months. Thanks. Yeah. So um, one of the issues that COVID laid bare, but has been an issue for a long time is early education um, and making sure that families have safe quality early ed that they can afford, of course, to be able to go to work and keep kids safe. Um, I'm on the early ed workforce council. One of the challenges of early education, of course, is it's really expensive for families. And also early ed providers barely make, they make just more than minimum wage and um, an incredibly, you know, hardworking, well-trained um, group of providers, but it's really hard to keep people in those jobs. They're hard jobs and you can, you know, go to the Encore Casino and, and make more money. Um, so we are trying to um, make sure that we are able to provide some rate increases to keep people in um, early ed provider jobs, keep teachers in those jobs. Um, they're mostly women and women of color who are doing that work. And um, so there's, there's more to do there. But something we did in the budget is um, $20 million uh, for a rate reserve. So that money goes directly to the teachers, to the early ed teachers to improve how much money they're getting um, in their rates. So that is a good piece. Um, and a couple bills that I have filed this session address early education. Um, and also the out of school time care. So places like the Y um, or Boys and Girls Club that do out of school, school time care, um, they also struggle with the rates that they're paid and making sure that kids can stay in those programs for low or no cost. Um, there's gonna be a lot happening about it this session. The federal government is providing the state with billions of dollars and a lot of that's going to come to early education. So what we're trying to do now as a state is figure out what does that look like? How do we create a system that works for families when so much has been broken and not working for so long? Yeah, hopefully those um, those funds that were just announced, um, I noticed on the City of Somerville Finance Committee, they were talking about how much money they anticipate getting from the federal government, how much is earmarked for specific programs, how much will be, uh, I hate to say it, but kind of free cash that the city can back up what they've already expended in some of the COVID related expenses and other amounts of money, other dollar amounts 
will be earmarked for future programs. But um, I did notice, you know, the difference. There was a difference between what Somerville was awarded and what Medford was awarded. Can, do you have a sense of why and how the federal government came up with the calculation to award that money? Was it based on population or need or I, I, quickly, I don't, I don't understand how they came up with the calcs. I believe it was a CDBG formula that has existed for a long time. Um, and this did come up as you probably heard as whereas Chelsea did not get nearly as much money as say a Newton did. Um, and Chelsea incredibly has been incredibly hard hit by the um, coronavirus. So part of it is Somerville's population because we are 80,000 that helps and also our poverty level. Um, and so we did get more funding than Medford did, although both cities did did well and will um, we'll get a good amount of funding directly to the cities. So some will come through the state, some will come directly to the cities, which should be helpful. There's obviously been so many challenges. Well, um, it's, cer it's certainly gonna help any of the municipalities who have had to dig deep and fund some of the programs during COVID um, and are now, as you say, at the beginning of their budget seasons as well. So a lot of the information that's gonna be coming out of the municipalities will travel from the feds to the state, to the municipalities. We are anticipating, um, we are anticipating a brutal budget season here in the city. Uh, I would assume all municipalities are gonna be in the same boat because they've had to um, free up money during the pandemic from free cash and reserves and other places. So let's hope that the elected officials, not only city, but state, understand this is not a free for all. Do not spend this money in any way, shape or form other than to make good for those who have had the toughest time moving forward. Yeah, um, one of the challenges is, is that the federal money is really, it's one time money. So a year, maybe two years, and it, it is a lot of money. So there's um, important things that we can do for supporting, you know, food, shelter, the basics for people to get back on their feet, but it's going to be hard because we will see a drop off, you know, in, in two years and this money won't last. Yeah, let's just hope that there are some elected officials out there who don't look at this as like a windfall. You know, I just won the lottery, so I'm going to go out and spend it on things that I can't afford in the future. Let's hope so. Okay. Um, Christine, let's go into some of the other efforts. And then I, I know you want to talk about the budget season that's coming up. Um, and the state. Um, one of the things that I noticed, and, I, and because we are in municipal election years, both in Medford and Somerville, the, you were one of the co-sponsors of a voting rights bill for 16 and 17 year olds. Can you give us a quick update on where that is? Sure, there's a couple voting rights bills this year, but there is one particular to Somerville about 16 and 17 year olds. But if I could also touch on, there's something called the Votes Act. Um, which is a broad, um, it's kind of the opposite that some other states are doing right now, but would broadly open up um, voting rights for people in Massachusetts, um, including same day voter registration, uh, mail in ballots, um, uh, no excuse absentee voting, a number of other um, ways to help people who are serving a um, jail sentence to be able to vote. Um, and that's called the votes bill and I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. So the, the mail-in voting, which we know was a big success this past year, um, we passed that as a coronavirus stopgap measure. I think the good thing is that it was wildly successful. We had a bigger turnout than, um, than I think we've had in, in certainly many, many years. I don't know, I don't know if it was the guy, the guy at the top who drove that, but you know, the mail-in voting was successful and safe. So we're trying to make that permanent to make sure it's as easy as possible to vote. So um, Barbara, how do you feel about it? How do, how do you think, um, you know, it, when you say it's wildly successful, I don't think you're saying that from your standpoint, it's from the voters. The voters loved it. Yeah. Right. Yes, it's not from, um, while well, I'm grateful to be in my position, um, the voters, I mean, I heard over and over was so much easier. People didn't have to take a day off to, to vote or worry about when, how they could fit it in their schedule with their kids and their 
um, other responsibilities. So mail-in voting was was easy, but it was also secure, and um, you know, it, of course, was um, an appropriate way to vote. And I think it it proved itself. So I'm hoping we can put that in place um, in an ongoing way. Um, and certainly, I think there'll be attempts to to keep it going at least through the fall, through the through the municipal elections, um, because we know we'll still still be feeling the coronavirus pandemic. But I think even after we come out of the pandemic, it's the kind of thing that we should be doing um, from here on out. And you shouldn't have to, um, you know, prove that you you um, were sick or you had to get an absentee ballot, but be able to do early voting. And we know that that's a um, a good way to increase the number of people actually exercising their right to vote. It's voting made easy, safe, and secure. Exactly. And I think that's what all of us are aiming for. You know, if I trust, if I trust the internet and I trust electronic banking with my money, I should be able to trust um, the the elections commissions of each and every city and city and town in this Commonwealth of Massachusetts with how I want my vote counted. So thank you for that. On 16 and 17 year old? Yes. So this is a Somerville home rule that I've filed um, along with the other members of the delegation. So as you, you probably know, but 16 and 17 year olds organized in Somerville and worked with the city council to pass this bill as at the council level last year. Um, it's a home rule petition. So because the state governs voting rules, um, the state would have to the state legislature also has to pass the 16 and 17 year old voting bill. This would be municipal uh, level voting. Um, we've not yet, we didn't get it passed last session, so I filed it again. There's both an effort across the state to make it a local option where Somerville could just opt to do this um, and then to try things like this home rule petition where just Somerville would get this opportunity. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, we've seen um, young people organizing, particularly on climate change, but also on gun violence, education funding, so many really critical issues. Um, and, um, you know, coming in to talk to me in an incredibly articulate and well argued and well reasoned ways, in, in ways that honestly put some of the adults to shame. So, um, you know, I, I'm. I think there's a lot of good reasons to let 16 and 17 year olds vote and and honestly get into the habit and get more more um, people into the habit of voting throughout their lives. No disagreement here. No disagreement here. When I, I had, to, I, I think you know it, but I, I first enlisted in the United States Air Force when I was 17 years old and I had to get my parents permission to do that, yet I could not vote because the voting age was not changed until after that. So I had some kids from Somerville High School who were lobbying around the 16 and 17 year old right to vote. They came on the show a uh, year and a half ago. Um, brilliant, articulate, the reasons why they wanted to do this. I don't know why anyone would wanna discourage young adults to participate in civic life. I just don't get it, but best wishes on that bill. Yeah, we're going to keep working together, and other communities around the state are also pushing for this. So I'm hopeful we can we can get there. Great. So let's take it from budget. That is your favorite time of the year, other than Christmas. I know <laughs> budget season for those of you who are tuning in and really don't know what um, elected officials have to go through when they're crafting the budget. Um, it is um, fun. To observe it, it is not fun to be in the middle of it because each rep or city council or mayor, they're all fighting for a piece of the pie. Why don't you take it away, Christine, and kind of lay it out for the audience. What happens next? Sure. So I'm on the House Ways and Means Committee. So we've been having budget hearings for the last few weeks on every, you know, from the environment to education to health and human services. Um, so now there is a House version of the budget. Um, and that budget is is good. Um, it is um, the Student Opportunity Act is, of course, a huge part of the budget, um, which the Student Opportunity Act is uh, the big education funding that we passed two years ago right before the pandemic. So we passed a um, transformative 
a way of funding uh, districts. And then we were hit with uh, kind of the biggest recession uh, or depression um, on an economic level that we had seen. So this year we are coming back and we are funding the Student Opportunity Act um, to keep it in line with where it was supposed to be fully funded. So that is a good thing. Um, one of the challenges, as people know, is the enrollment numbers for schools are all over the map. Um, so we know- That's as a result of COVID. We as a result of COVID, right? right so right. some students have, have um, left school temporarily. We don't know when they're coming back, but they will be. And some may not come back, may have moved, may have other, there may be other reasons. So they may have they may have gone to a charter school. They right. may have gone to another municipality. They, they school, moved out of state. Right. right. Yeah. So, um, so enrollment numbers are down because of COVID, and that throws off the whole funding formula. So we know that this year. So there is some money. I think there's not enough money, but forty million dollars. There's a reserve account. So districts that see an uptick in enrollment during the year can access some of this money to say, wait, you know, the 10% the, uh, of kids we thought left, they actually were here, they were just being homeschooled or kept home and now they're here. Or they may be coming back mid year. Right, and that yeah. affects how the district can pay for them. It is a challenge for districts that are deciding now how to spend their dollars. As you said, they're doing their budgeting now. So it is a challenge um, and I'm hoping we can keep working together with them. I certainly um, both, Somerville and Medford have done amazing work in the, the many um, challenges, isn't even the right word, but the many um, huge, huge obstacles and challenges that have faced the schools in the last uh, year. Well, let me ask, before we go into the other details of how the budget is actually crafted, what is the governor saying the overall picture is? Our receipts are down, up, steady, flat. What is the budget eventually going to look like? Yeah, so we, um, as the, so the governor, House and Senate all decide on what they call consensus revenue number, which is what they are, what, based on economic experts, what we all guess the revenue will be for this year. Uh, taxes are actually a little bit above where people thought we were going to be. However, because the um, income tax deadline was moved to May, um, a lot of taxes have not come in yet. So it is also really hard to tell. So the budget does take money from what we call the rainy day fund, the state savings account. It doesn't take as much as we thought it might, but it does take money from the rainy day fund. And it's a strange budget because um, while there is a good amount of money in rental assistance, housing vouchers, a uh, good amount of money in food assistance, all the things that we need in a pandemic, we're about to get five, five and a half billion dollars from the federal government. And that will be a huge add on to all of those programs. So I always fight for housing assistance, uh, rental assistance. Um, and we have a down payment on that in this budget, but in a few months we are going to have um, many, many times that going out the door in housing assistance, which is, definitely needed and it's a good thing but it's you know happening over the next couple months the the uh, um increase that you anticipate for housing assistance is that related to the eviction moratorium in any way yeah so with the eviction moratorium um lifting the challenge is making sure as many people as possible can get raft which is the rental assistance uh state rental assistance program or other programs that keep people in their homes and not going into shelter. Um, the state has um, put out uh, millions and millions of dollars in RAF money. So the RAF just goes to, to landlords to pay rent. Um, and for RAF, so as an example, so RAF last year, we funded it at $50 million at the state level. Um, we're slated to get 800 million from the feds for housing. So 50 million to 800 million. There is a huge need for housing um, and housing assistance. And I'm hopeful the federal money will really help to fill that. Fill that and need. refresh <laughs> refresh our memories again. When does the state moratorium lift here in Massachusetts? Is that October? It is lifted. We are now reliant on the federal moratorium, which is still, so there isn't a state moratorium right now. There's a Got federal it. moratorium that has been extended a number of times. I think it's 
if it's through April or May, but it, it keeps getting extended by the feds. So I would anticipate how this may work is that once the federal government starts releasing the money and says, okay, here's the fed money for the states to administer for housing assistance, they will then lift that eviction moratorium. That could be. And the challenge there is there are people who may not qualify for rental assistance. Um, if you're not on a lease, um, or if your immigration status means that you're not, um, that you might be more um, concerned about your going to get assistance, um, you might not be able to get the rental assistance. Um, and so I think th there is definitely still worry that people will be getting evicted and we're trying to make sure people know their rights, have legal representation and can get any of the assistance that's that's possible. So the, the, what you're describing is there may be some loopholes as to yeah, who qualifies. The, yeah, people will fall through the cracks and that's what we're worried about. Right, very good, yeah. very good. Anything um, else on the budget? So it, yeah, it sounds, so, what it does sound like though is that the federal government is backstopping the states by giving this fed money assistance that's coming in yes and that's good and i think we have an opportunity to use it for for recovery and for basic needs that so many people have um and again it's not going to last so um there's more to do you know after after this but we are going to be getting a good amount of federal money um on the budget the next step is that we we filed oh a uh, little over a thousand amendments to the budget because it's it's good it's not great and then we debate those amendments um next week so just um i filed a couple amendments i just want to highlight like one area which is of course, um, there's a lot of state roads in Somerville, and unfortunately, there's been a number of uh, accidents, um, tragic fatalities on the state roads, and other um, hit and run accidents. There was. Are we talking specifically about McGrath Highway, L. Y. Yeah. Parkway? Yeah. So yes, there's McGrath Highway, L. Y. Parkway, Mystic Ave, which runs um, along 93. These are state run roads um, that the city doesn't have jurisdiction over. The state mass dot usually has jurisdiction, and they have different rules, unfortunately, than the city can impose. Um, and so we have been struggling with the safety of those roads for a long time and really trying to push mass, mass DOT to lower speed limits, put in more um, crosswalks and improve safety for, for bikes and pedestrians and, and for cars. Um, so I have a couple amendments, one on Alewife Brook Parkway, um, and then one on Mystic Ave. And I'm working with Rep Con so Rep Connolly and I, are, we are, district comes together around McGrath Highway. So we're working on something in that area as well. Um, but there's a lot of need in those areas to, to just make, make the road safer. Speaking of Rep Conley, I know that you see him or talk to him more than I do. Tell him he is still on the list, but until he responds to my emails, he's not getting back on the show. All right, I'll so, let him know. I'll let him tell, know. Tell him that came directly from me. No, I know how busy everybody is and, and I appreciate all the time that you guys give us here. Um, so budget season starts, it's officially started. And when do you have to have the balanced budget presented? Um, it's supposed to be by the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, which, which is June 1st, uh, July 1st. July, but July. it often is a little bit late. Um, so yes, it is supposed to be by the end of the fiscal year. Um, uh, when do you anticipate that we will know what the um, monies that are allocated to the municipalities? When do you suspect we may have some kind of an indication? Um, we 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 are close to knowing that now at the state level, only because the the cities. Um, I mean, the is House and Senate try to give a ballpark so cities can plan. I think what the big uh, calculation is also the federal money because there's the federal government is still working out um, exactly how cities can spend that money. So I think it is a tough budgeting year for cities also to figure out what they're getting from the state and from the feds and then the huge amount of need, need that they have too. If I were to ask you the toughest question of today's chat, where do you want the most money to go to? Hmm. 
I'm I'm probably always going to say housing because of the housing crisis and affordability crisis in our district. Um, so housing is a huge one. There's also a lot of need um, in in transportation and um, and in looking at how do we make get more people on public transportation? How do we make it? more clean, more uh, affordable. So I have a, you know, a pilot on looking at free bus fares. How do we actually get more people on public transit and make that safe um, and doable? So I think that's more in the realm of the COVID recovery. There's both the really basic needs of, of housing and then looking at how do we get people um, you know, back to work and do so in a, in a way that's good for the environment and safe for everyone. And I think that's the transit piece. As well. So. Yeah, I think, um, you know, your first choice is probably the choice of a lot of people. Housing stability, food stability, healthcare stability, those are probably the top three things that people are looking at coming out of this. Economic recovery for businesses, industry, um, small business, especially because you know what I do when I'm not hosting shows. Um, all of that, hopefully, there will be enough money to assist everyone. Um, I don't think you know anyone expects to be made whole after the 14 months of stress and downtime and economic stress that we've all had. Um, I don't think anyone expects that, but they do expect to be able to be at least given a fighting chance right. to, to recover and move on. Yeah, and the state's been doing these small business grants. Um, they've been doing uh, for for months, so uh, I don't know, 500 million has gone out the door um, to to provide something to small business as a grant and not not as a loan um, to keep them afloat. I know uh, many many Somerville, you know, restaurants, other small businesses have gotten that money. Um, and another bright spot of the budget is we were able to fund uh, the Mass Cultural Council, which goes to the arts, to the artists um, who have. I mean, it's really struggled in the past year, um, but goes to the Somerville and Medford Arts Council and also some of the some of the local artists directly. And that's been a really hard hit industry as well. OK, shall I shall I stop the grilling and, and let you free form for the next one minute, Christine? We've got about a minute left here. Um, sure, I, I I guess I would say it is Earth Day. Um, and, you know, to, to be able to end with a, a quick environmental thing, um, there's a new initiative that I'm working on actually with Rep Connolly on air quality in, um, in our districts, and is particularly looking at I-93 and how much that affects the air quality around the Mystics, Ten Hills, and East Somerville. And so uh, Rep Connolly and I are working on improving the both outdoor and indoor air quality. And it's an exciting bill. So I'll come on with Mike at some point. I'll get him on and we'll talk about it. Maybe. And I venture to say that you will have one of the biggest cheerleaders in the city with uh, City Council President Matt McLaughlin. who's yeah, also Matt, been fighting for it for years. Yes, Matt has been known to, to talk about this, but it's a huge issue in that, in that area and one that uh, doesn't get enough attention. And there's some activists and residents who've been doing great work. So we should, we should get together and we'll talk more about that on a future show, but. Please feel free to come back anytime. Tell Rep Conley, uh, no hard feelings, but if he doesn't show up very quick, I'm going to come looking for him over in Cambridge. I will let him know. State Representative Christine Barber, thank you so much for joining us here on Somerville Media Center Live. For SMC, I'm Joe Lynch. Please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.